where will you find resilience? Redeploy. Hi. So today we're going to talk about getting comfortable with being underwater. My name is Ronnie Chen. I am an engineering manager at Twitter. Uh, this is my Twitter handle, RonoFTW. I am also a trained technical diver with a background centered around shipwreck exploration. Now, technical diving is underwater diving that involves uh, increased depths and more challenging conditions, which put you into situations where you physically cannot go to the surface if something goes wrong with your dive. It's really not uncommon for a diver to spend uh, several hours at depth and then be several more hours from being able to safely ascend to the surface and even more time from emergency medical support. The gear that we use for these dive trips can involve six or more tanks weighing over 200 pounds. Instead of breathing from premixed gases, you wear a portable gas blending device called a rebreather that you can see in that picture right there. That it recycles the gas that you exhale and allows you to change the composition of that gas that you breathe in to allow you to survive at deeper depths. This is the same kind of technology that's used in spacesuits, and it allows a diver to do dives to 300 feet, 400 feet, and beyond, and increase the dive time to about six hours before needing to come to the surface. When you start talking about this kind of dive time at this kind of depth, which can mean being um, exposed to 10 or more atmospheres of pressure, the complexity of those dives means that what you're participating in are almost all team-based missions. Why is that significant? Well, that means that technical diving is one of those high-risk, high-consequence fields that is chock full of complex systems, the same as aerospace or emergency medicine, um, the kind of fields that people who study resilience <laughs> love to draw parallels to, which is exactly what I'm going to do in this talk. So technical diving is filled with complex failure-prone systems that are really hard to reason about in changing environments, um, and engineering is too. And so what does that mean? Well, I'm going to put a target on my back by referencing Dr. Cook's paper here. Literally the first bullet point in how complex systems fail is that complex systems are intrinsically hazardous. And hazardous is bad, right? It's something that you want to avoid. And so a lot of talking about resilience involves talking about safety and how to increase safety in your environment and how to mitigate risk. This is not going to be a talk about that. This is a talk about danger, or more accurately, a talk about how to take risks and why we choose to pursue hobbies and careers in these high-risk, high-consequence fields. And if we're honest with ourselves, this is an active choice that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. When we think about failure and resiliency, about better practices, we're implicitly making these trade-offs about what we're willing to commit to changing and what we don't. I mean, if we're really focused on safety first and foremost as a primary concern, we can make huge strides by focusing our energy exclusively on that and prioritizing safety above everything else. And you can't completely eliminate risk, but you can be very selective about the level of complexity and the amount of risk that you take on, right? You could, instead of going diving, choose to go snorkeling instead, right? Why expose yourself to that level of risk? And when I talk about risk, this is just a partial list of some of the risks of technical diving. I'm not gonna read all of them out loud, but the one that I love to call out is number 12, 
which is that the chemical agent that is inside of your rebreather that removes the carbon dioxide from your gas supply will react with water to create a caustic liquid soda that when inhaled will leave chemical burns inside of your mouth, airways, and lungs and leave dramatic scarring. It's one of the nastier things that can happen underwater and it can be triggered just by having a simple O-ring leak, right? You're diving underwater, water leaks in, mixes with the chemical, suddenly you have caustic cocktail circulating around in what you used to be breathing. So faced with these kinds of risks, it's a really reasonable question to ask why divers continue to dive. If your goal is just about mitigating risk, the limits of what you can achieve, the kind of dives you can do, the kind of sites that you can explore, what you can see, is going to be a lot more restricted. We simply wouldn't be able to pursue the same kind of goals that we can if we're willing to make accommodations for risk, if we're willing to start talking about incurring risk in exchange for pursuing activities for those goals. I'm willing to bet that every single person here today has a list of changes that they can make in their engineering environment that would make it safer. But you just haven't had the time, you haven't had the opportunity, you haven't been able to prioritize it yet. And you all could, hypothetically, stop the world and focus solely on investing in techni uh, reducing technical debt, on monitoring, on alerting, on training. You could limit your infrastructure to what your engineers could accurately maintain a mental model of. You could do all of those things, but most of us are not going to choose to do that. And that's a perfectly rational decision to make because for all of this talk about safety, there is a balance to be struck, right? Resilient teams are making an explicit trade-off to take on more risk, to be comfortable in underwater environments, in risky environments, because it opens up opportunities. It opens up opportunities to explore, to pursue greater challenges, um, to tackle goals that would be unobtainable otherwise, which for a lot of people just makes the work or the activity a lot more fun. It allows you to move faster and to give you better uh, understanding of the system behavior at the operating limits. There's a lot of information, a lot of skill, and a lot of fun to be had when you increase your tolerance for risk. And speaking plainly, there's a competitive edge to be had here. Um, to operate with a higher tolerance of risk if you can manage it responsibly, right? That's the big caveat, if you can manage it responsibly. And to be able to leverage that, we need to refine our judgment in a way that allows us to stay in the sweet spot of maximizing those benefits that we just talked about without inadvertently taking on a higher level of risk than you intended to or that you're able to respond to or handle. Sounds great, right? Lots of benefits, so what's the catch? Well, organizations and teams are under a lot of pressure in a number of ways that make it hard to take on risk in what we consider a responsible way, in a way to do that and really be aware and intentional about how much burden you're taking on. Now, this is by no means a complete list but it is some of the larger sources of pressure, especially from organizations and from teams. And you can see how that intention to manage risk responsibly can break down if teams are um, under pressure that encourages them to take on higher amounts of risk or to drift into states of increasing risk, right? A team that lacks psychological safety, that prevents you from speaking out, a team that frankly has other goals in mind, that doesn't care about resilience as much. A team where people aren't empowered to drive change. A team where normalization of deviance is a constant factor. 
Now, these pressures tend to be interrelated and they can be causal. Environmental environments that have one of these things are more likely to have others. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about those. So number one, lack of psychological safety. If you have a culture that discourages bad news, that discourages people from uh, slipping deadlines or um, you know, giving information that's not expected, you're constantly going to be pushing back on pressure to conceal or dismiss threats that you see. And one of the common ways that this pressure comes about that discourages the sharing of information is when the key decision makers, the people with power, aren't the same people who feel the loss firsthand. They don't have the same skin in the game. They don't feel the same stakes. And the people who do experience that risk are not empowered to dictate the plan. And this obviously creates barriers for you to alert when you see a risk, when you become aware of something. It creates barriers to respond to risk. Whoever is driving those decisions needs to have access to the same information. And ideally, they need to be able to come to the same conclusions with that information that you would use to make decisions, or those decisions are gonna be critically flawed, right? One of the key things about an environment like this is that the information flow is compromised. There's a lack of ability to communicate risk properly and give it the right amount of weight and bring the overall system to the same level of alert that it would otherwise. And again, another reason for this and something that can contribute to this problem is the prioritization of other goals. Using the information that's available, are we coming to the same decisions about what the business and production goals are? Is the company simply at a state where production goals come first, business goals come first? And when you have a high number of issues that you want to tackle, when you have run the business goals, when you have product goals, when you have launch goals, when you have tech debt issues, infrastructure support, you need a clear process for setting priorities, especially when there's resource constraints and time constraints. And sometimes the need to establish priorities becomes so challenging that that in itself becomes a blocking action until it's resolved. And the team starts focusing on finding a perfect solution or a solution that tackles all of the problems instead of pursuing incremental improvements. And this is very typical, but it's especially hazardous in complex systems because by the time you come to a resolution, your system might have drifted into a different state. The decisions may not apply anymore. They may not be uh, reasonable anymore. Tied into this is the lack of ability of people on the team to drive change at all. If you don't have the ownership or the empowerment to push back on these priorities that are set by someone else with a different set of information, someone who doesn't have skin in the game, you're just kind of a cog in the wheel in this overall organizational structure. You may not have the credibility to sound the alarm. You may not have the pathways open for these communication channels to voice this. Or even if you do voice it, you may not be getting the resources to execute on a plan to make these changes. And so this really hurts teams who are collecting data, who see a path forward, but don't have the ownership to push back and to actually alter the roadmap, alter the plan. And so you now have a system where communication is compromised, ability to act is compromised. There's a lot of pressure to deliver on goals. What happens? One of the largest pressures here is something that I think is familiar to a lot of people who study resilience, something that we call normalization of deviance. And like I said, it frequently stems from the other pressures that the team is under, but at some point it also becomes self-sustaining and becomes its own uh, driving form of pressure. Astronaut Mike Mullaney describes normalization of deviance 
as that human tendency, particularly in pressure situations, to take a safety shortcut. Now what happens when you take that safety shortcut? Frequently, the first time you do this, the second time you do this, nothing bad happens. We're talking about risk, probability. And the absence of something bad happening gives you false feedback. It starts to reinforce the idea that that shortcut that you took was acceptable. And the next time that you're in that pressure situation, you're more likely to try it again. And over time, that shortcut becomes a new normal. And this has worse implications than just the specific shortcut that you took. Because you start to socialize the acceptability of a higher level of risk than you intended to take on, both to yourself and to the people around you. You start to adapt, and your experience stops being a suitable gauge of risk. You start to blunt your response to seeing risk, to seeing alerts and signs. And you start to compromise that ability of accurate gauging, and that forms social pressure. This is just how we do things. So you take all of these pressures, and you throw that onto a team, and you see a group of people that are not empowered to operate in a high-consequence environment in a resilient way. They're actually being cut off from building the kind of judgment and the kind of expertise that's needed to make an informed decision about how to balance risk. So how do we deal with that? We're gonna look now at some of the characteristics of a great dive team that happen to push back against the pressure to take on too much risk. Again, this is an environment that gives you a lot of benefits. There's more to explore, more to see, more to experience when you take on risk. And so it becomes very alluring to slide into that state of, well, we can just push a little bit here. We can take a shortcut there. It'll be OK. And so here are some foundational elements of a really strong dive team, one that's actually able to make informed decisions and informed trade-offs about the amount of risk that they take on. Number one, strong communication and psychological safety. These two things are so important and so interrelated that I'm putting them together. Especially when the stakes are high, this is the foundation of a strong team. All of the other things that we're looking for are built on top of the inherent trust that teammates have for each other, the ability for teammates to communicate plainly and share information. One of the founding principles of group dives for technical dives and even uh, recreational scuba diving is that anyone can turn a dive at any time. Shaming is not allowed. If you prioritize the dive, and the dive experience over someone else's sense of trust and safety, you're gonna have a hard time finding dive buddies. And this reinforces the idea that aborting a dive when you're not comfortable or when an incident happens, when you see something that causes you to go into high alert is normal. Calling a dive, terminating a dive, it's okay. And you hammer that in over and over again. And this builds that psychological safety that anybody who sees this risk is empowered to say something. The other thing uh, that happens in a world with strong communication, psychological safety, is a culture of recognition about the importance of knowledge sharing at, um, at every level. Unshared failures are low value because learning doesn't occur there, or learning is very limited to the group of people who have access to that. When information is shared, when that knowledge is disseminated, the lessons from those failures are preserved and uh, broadcasted to the entire group. And so dive stories about those cases where you turned a dive, where you saw something and you made an alert are really, really important to the culture of a strong dive team. Another aspect 
is the sensitivity to the environment. Obviously, divers go in, wind conditions change, water conditions change. The ocean is a complex system and it drifts over time. Whatever starting information, whatever assumptions that you make going into the dive could be inaccurate. Your knowledge of the location of the dive, the challenges that you're gonna see at depth could be inaccurate or incomplete. It's true for diving and it's also true for engineering and every other complex system. So to have a strong dive team, you need to possess the situational awareness to notice when there's some aspect of the environment that doesn't match the starting data, or notice when the environment has shifted. Notice when the assumptions that you made were incorrect. You need a way to reevaluate and reassess the information that you have to update those assumptions and to be able to change decisions based on that new information. And you know you'll hit this criteria when your team has the ability to redefine success when conditions change. When you set out on a dive with the team, your primary goal that you agree on might be explore the dive site, examine a shipwreck at the bottom. And if conditions are favorable, if you're able to locate the wreck quickly, visibility is good, current is low, you might make a decision to penetrate the wreck and explore inside the ship itself. And if situation changes, conditions are unfavorable, if there's an equipment malfunction, visibility drops all of a sudden, you change to a fallback goal, which might just be everyone survives the dive and we get out of here safely. And the ability to have that awareness to transition and update that success criteria is critical in a complex system. That's what we talk about when we talk about resiliency, that taking in that feedback and updating your success criteria, updating what you intend to do, how you intend to do it. And it's really hard to sustain a team where different members have different levels of risk tolerance. When you have an imbalance like this, it can create conflict between people who alert very quickly and people who don't people who are very sensitive to risk and people who are not. It can create disengagement for people who you know, keep flagging things and then find out that no one is paying attention. And this impacts the collection and transmission of information within that group. One of the ways this happens is, typically speaking, if you're in alignment, you can assume no information means there's nothing new to learn. Not, base conditions haven't changed. But if there's misalignment, you can't make that assumption. Maybe they didn't say something because it didn't cross their risk threshold, but it would have crossed mine, and I would have wanted to know. For any piece of information that you have, you now need to track down the source of that information to understand what kind of filters have been applied to it. And so this incurs a huge burden to figuring out what the information that you have actually means, and therefore what decisions you want to make from that information. So you can't interpret the information that you have. You have discrepancies where certain people are making decisions that you're left out of implicitly because they're filtering it in a different way. So what you wanna do is build a team that has the same levels of risk tolerance or at the very least, a shared understanding so that you can avoid these issues with information sharing. And one of the ways that dive teams do this, especially when this mismatch in evaluating risk is due to a skill imbalance, is to have the least experienced person lead the dive. So that means the whole team prepares together, we train together, we talk about starting conditions, we communicate, but the person who's actually leading the mission, the person who swims in front, the person who has the most um, ability to say, we're gonna turn this dive, we're gonna call this, to flag an alert, is the least experienced person in the group. This is one of the best ways to equalize a gap in experience or a gap in risk tolerance. And repeatedly doing this helps to build overall team competency it makes sure that you're not leaving 
your least experienced person behind, which is very easy to do if the situation were reversed. If your most experienced person is in front, if they don't check behind them frequently enough, you've left someone behind. And so doing it this way, uh, least experienced person in the front of the dive, it also helps to build muscle memory. It again, improves that psychological safety inside of the system. It allows people who might not be uncomfortable flagging to someone who's more experienced to say, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not comfortable moving forward. And it gives them that um, authority and that ownership to the people who most need it. And as an added bonus, it also helps you to identify vulnerable areas in your system, any places where the documentation, the lore, the training can be improved to help uh, also build up those gaps. The last aspect that I'm going to talk about today for what makes this good dive team is solid judgment. This seems a little bit obvious on its face, but at the same time, most of us harbor this misconception that experience is kind of correlated very heavily with number of dives, right? You've done a lot of dives, you're an experienced diver, you know what you're doing. And that's not really true. The things that make up an experienced diver or an experienced engineer is intuition, judgment, and skill. And to really harp on that a little, this is a statistic to emphasize how incorrect that number of dives or amount of time diving is to experience. Jill Heinerth is one of the foremost underwater explorers in the world. And this line is from a talk that she gave on rebreather safety when I first started tech diving. If you own a rebreather for five years, 2% of you are going to die on it. So that comes out to one person in 50 in a five-year time span. Number of dives does not make you a ex more experienced diver, a safer diver, a diver that's better able to gauge risk. You need to be building intuition. You need to be building an understanding of how to safely take on risk and how to refine your judgment. So we're going to talk about how to do that. Number one, divers practice for failures. In engineering, we typically refer to these as fire drills, game days. Stay in practice for the failures that you can anticipate. It's the best way to retain muscle memory for high pressure conditions. It's the best way to cope with task overloading. It's a way to test your skills, test your monitoring tools, test your equipment. Especially important for systems that fail open, which happens a lot in diving. I haven't been able to dive for a while because I'm over eight months pregnant, but you can bet that when I return to the water, it's not going to be a team technical dive to 300 feet the first time I go. And even if I had been diving regularly, part of staying sharp and making sure that I'm able to be accurately gauging the amount of risk I'm taking on if I do a dive I haven't done before in conditions I haven't seen before is making sure that I stay competent at the skills that I've learned and that I'm capable of applying them correctly in the environment that I'm in. Knowing what to do is only helpful if you also know when to do those things. And divers bring the experience that they have, the judgment that they've collected, into their planning, which in engineering terms, we call them pre-mortems. So in your pre-dive prep, you talk over the assumptions that you're making you make contingency plans if your environment changes. You might talk about those fallback goals that we mentioned previously. What conditions might cause you to change your criteria from we're going to try to swim to the front of the ship and explore an area that we haven't seen before to switch to everybody gets out of this alive. This is another chance right before your dive for the team to align on risk tolerance and to set some milestones or checkpoints on when to reevaluate your goals, when to reevaluate uh, the heuristics and check your assumptions. And finally, dive stories again. One of the most valuable parts of being on a dive trip with experienced divers 
It's not just the dives that you do, but the stories that you share on the boat, on the way to the dive, on the way out. You get the wealth of experience without having to put your own butt on the line. And you know what you never see in a dive postmortem when people are sharing dive stories, sitting around a table, the output is never a list of JIRA tickets. <laughs> <It's n> <laughs> you don't walk away with a set of action items on what to follow up on. It's far more important in these dive stories to talk about why it made sense to continue a dive if you had a dodgy piece of equipment, or why it was reasonable to skip a safety check. You're not walking away with a bulleted list on what you need to fix. Another thing that happens in uh, postmortems, the good dive stories produce a lot of context. They talk a lot about what people were thinking. There's not a focus on root causes. They provide a lot of, this is the environment, here's what happened. They talk more about all of the different co contributing factors. Dive stories contain a lot more awareness of the lucky close calls that you have, the near misses, instead of focusing only on the failures. This happened because someone did this, some human error. So you lessen that bias on negative outcomes. So when you conduct your postmortems in engineering, you'll have a lot more success in improving your team's understanding of the situation, in improving their judgment by emulating dive stories in those postmortems instead of focusing on those JIRA tickets, instead of being able to say, yep, we did a po postmortem, here are the action items, we never have to talk about it again. So you take all of these things together, a team that has strong communication, psychological safety, a team that is sensitive to the environment, especially as it changes, a team that has a strong alignment of risk tolerance, a team that is continuing to build on their judgment. And you have a team with a common goal that's able to combine information about the environment with a reliable assessment of their own skills and expertise. And you have a team that's empowered to speak up when they, what, uh, about what they see. And when you empower this team to make decisions, you can have a lot more confidence that when they make a call about how much risk to take on and what that uh, benefits are for taking on those risks, it's coming from a realistic place. It's not something that is born out of organizational dysfunction or misguided machismo, bragging rights. And this allows you to be really intentional about the work and make informed trade-offs about risk. So you can actually do what I said of taking on risk and getting those benefits of shipping faster, doing something that's more challenging, more fun. So key takeaways for this talk. Number one, taking on risk can be a rational choice. But in order to do that, your team needs to be empowered to push back against the organizational and system, systemic pressures that prevent you from doing this safely. And if nothing else, tell more dive stories. Thank you very much. <laughs>